What's up, guys? I'm Felipe, and this is the Boulder Podcast. We tell stories of people who took the bold decision of leaving their countries. Uh, today, I have with me Baylor, who is going to talk a little bit about the, his the history, the story, right, of St. Patrick. Yeah, we'll do a blend of history, folklore, all the stories we know about St. Patrick. Uh, what do you work with, Baylor? So my job is a storyteller. Um, there's tourism, there's a little bit of education. I go around to schools. I work in visitor centers, um, kind of spreading kind of ideas or stories that have been dying out about Irish culture. And hopefully I will move into other cultures as well, like Brazilian, French and Welsh. Uh, I, I Ireland has a very rich culture, right? Like... Uh, I don't know how many years uh, people live in this island. Uh, thousands and thousands of years. It's very difficult to say exactly because the, about a thousand years ago, the monks in Ireland, a lot of the monks living in the monasteries, they wrote down the stories that had been in books before. So the oldest versions of these books and stories are gone. So we just have to kind of read back through it and try and interpret because we have the written stuff and we had the things that we'll say poorer people had, which was the communities would speak to each other and they would share the story and they would all remember it. So they had their own version of each story. So the stories changed over time. So when you're looking at someone like St. Patrick, you can have hundreds of versions of the same one story of him. So it becomes very complicated for people to follow the story. For a long time, I worked in tourism before I moved to this and I saw a lot of Americans coming to Ireland and I find a lot of people from all over the world, they get a very generic experience in Ireland, like go to the Cliffs of Moher, go to Bunratty, go to Dublin Castle, go to Killarney. It's always the same few things we sell and we sell it all the same way. Yeah. But growing up with a family who have a long history in Ireland, we know so many of the local stories. And so... There's an awful lot of stories that Ireland has inspired around the world in places like Mexico, Argentina, France, England, and we've forgotten that. Mm. But the biggest reason I think Irish culture is so much older than others is because we're on the edge of Europe. So if we think about before Europeans had discovered North America and South America, Ireland was considered the very edge of the world to a lot of people. It was like the wild of the world. And when the Roman Empire took over most of Europe, Ireland was outside of its control. So it was like the Wild West. It was this mysterious land for a lot of Europeans. And we kept that culture. Because even when England controlled Ireland for 800 years, most of their control was around Dublin. They didn't really, they weren't too interested with the West Okay. So most of the culture in these areas survived, particularly with the poorer communities, because people still believed a lot of the supernatural up until very recently. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, there, there was no we, we think about Ireland today and we know it's very easy to travel from Dublin to the West. But before it would be a nightmare to go from Dublin to, to Galway, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been even when I was a child, mm -hmm. we didn't have these motorways. So I have memories of traveling from Shannon or Ennis in County Clare to Dublin and having to drive through almost all the little villages and towns. Mm -hmm. And it would take. I don't know, for, for big sporting matches, you could sometimes be four, four and a half hours driving instead of two and a half. Oh, my God. Yeah. So uh, uh, we said that Ireland has a lot of different cultural aspects, but the biggest one, you know, without a doubt, is St. Patrick. Uh, it's uh, what Ireland is most known for, I think. Right. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's funny, that's this uh, idea of St. Patrick being our number one saint, mm. it's very new. Um, for only maybe, maybe in the last 200 years, 150 years, St. Patrick is our main saint. But before that, St. Bridget would have been a bigger saint. Oh, really? I think so. Um, some people disagree, but it looks like she was much more important because... In ancient Ireland, we had four festivals. We had 
Samhain, which is Halloween today. Mm -hmm. We had um, St. Bridget's Day, which was called Imbolg. We had, uh, for the 1st of May, we had uh, Bialtana, and we had Lunasa in August. Mm -hmm. So they were for every three months. So for the changing of the seasons, okay. it was important for people to kind of celebrate it. And they believed in different types of magic, different times of year. Mm -hmm. And St. Bridget was really connected to spring and the return of summer. And the public holidays uh, for St. Bridget only appeared this year. Like yeah, 23. But, but going back many, many years, for hundreds of years, people wouldn't work on St. Bridget's Day. Okay. For a long, long time. So they're just bringing back an old tradition. They're actually just bringing back what we had in the past. Okay. Uh, but about St. Patrick's, mm -hmm. was St. Patrick a real person? Was was he, a, a, you know, is it a historic person or is he a myth? Yes, uh, there was a real person called St. Patrick. Um, he did live in Ireland. Um, he wrote two books. We have two books that he wrote as some way of understanding his life. Um, but after that, some of the biographies that were written about him, a lot of them are written 200 years after he died. Okay. So it becomes difficult then because there's a lot of folklore, a lot of mythology. And the other difficult thing is there was other men with similar names who came to bring Christianity to Ireland. There was a man from Rome called... Uh, Patricicus, I believe, and he was here a year before St. Patrick. So sometimes we think the adventures or the journey of a couple of people were oversimplified and put into one person okay. instead of many. Yeah, this I think it's hard to verify all kinds of facts around, like, because St. Patrick would have lived, what, in the fourth century? Fourth? Fourth. Fourth? For, uh, or 1400s, we think. Yeah. Um, he died, the most common belief of when he died, there's many dates, but we think he died 493 AD. 493. But there's other dates from 465 and everything in between, people have suggested. So it's very difficult. And some say he was 120 when he died. <laughs> so yeah. it's difficult. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to believe uh, this yeah. part. But... Uh, what do we know for sure about his birthplace? He's not Irish, is he? No, no, he's, um, we believe from Wales. Some again, because Wales wasn't a con, you know, the, the, the boundaries of countries weren't what they are today. So we believe he was living in Wales and we believe his dad worked for the Roman Empire. Okay, so yeah. his dad was a, a public servant, or <laughs> more or less, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, he works, uh, he, well, he would be like in England, uh, what England is today. Kind of an administrator for the Romans, yeah. something like this. And then wh what was, so the Roman Empire was because, yeah, Rome was dominating England, right? The the, yeah. the island of, of Britain, right? Up as far as Hadrian's Wall. There's a wall kind of in the north of England that was separating kind of Scotland and mm. people who were outside of Roman control. All right. Yeah, yeah. And how did he leave? Uh, what, like, what uh, facts do we have, or what? Yeah, we. It's actually we. We don't have. Um, it's very hard to say. We have a fact that we know one hundred percent. But the best information is that he was. Well, they say he was captured by pirates. Mm. We think that he might have gotten caught on purpose. Really? Because. When you were working for the title his dad had with the Romans, generally the children of the, these Roman civil servants, they, were, they would have been brought in when they became adults. So at 16, 15 or 16, they would have been asked or expected to travel to Rome and train up to become administrators as well. So a lot of children of wealthy Roman officers, it was normal for them to leave and travel somewhere else. And Ireland was a great spot for them because it was a wild place on the edge of Europe. Mm. So some say he got p captured leaving, you know, leaving home. Others say he kind of left and traveled to Ireland on purpose. So, But w was were there a lot of pirates uh, during these, these times, like uh, between England and Ireland? 
Yeah, it would it would have been um, well more common than today for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, we think he ended up in Sligo, yeah. in a place between Sligo and Mayo. There was supposed to be this ancient forest called Footlock, mm-hmm. but it's not. There's nothing left of it now. But what we have is old stories, old books recording it, and it's a best guess. Mm. So we think he lived there. And he was a slave. So the story is he was sold into slavery and he was minding kind of sheep for uh, a farmer in the area. And he was there for six years. And after that time, he heard voices. And some say it was the voice of God telling him he needed to return or escape. So he fled. And it's again said he traveled 200 miles across Ireland to somewhere around Wexford where he got on a boat and tried to return home. But he got into some trouble and ended up in France for a little bit before getting back really? to... Yeah. How how would this travel happen? Let's say if we were to translate this into facts, you know, let's take this story and let's translate this into... Uh, something logical. Yeah, something logical. How would he travel these 200 miles until Wexford? Well, I suppose it is possible. Um Like, I I have a story in my family of one of my great grand, well, my grand uncle, he was, um, he got pneumonia when he was a child Mm. and he was in hospital in Dublin um, almost, you know, 80 years ago, 90 years ago, probably. And the country was in a completely different situation and there was no, he didn't have a car in the family. Mm. His father died. Now they lived in Leash, so halfway across the country. And um, it was, I think, the winter time. And he had to go when he heard his dad was dead. Mm. He had, I think, six or seven younger brothers and sisters. And he was like maybe 15 or 12. So he needed to go back and work because there was no other option. Yeah. His family would starve if he didn't go back, you know. So um, there was all of these kind. It was normal, you know, for a previous generation being tougher and being traveling by foot. It was more normal. By foot? No. Yeah. Now, he might have <laughs> taken carts. He might have yeah. found people along the way to help. Yeah. But um, that could have been what happened with St. Patrick, that he had gotten assistance on the way. We don't know exactly how long it took him either. Yeah. So it could have taken him some time. He could have been taking stops. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And then he went to France. Yeah, like Probably, again, yeah. how how they got there, it could have been a storm pushed them south. Mm. It could have been that the boat was traveling that way anyway for trade. Yeah. Um, there could have been some danger that they had to change the course. But he ended up there for a while and then he went home. And then we were told he got a, heard a voice again telling him to come back to Ireland. So we say that was the voice of God and it, mm. it was asking him to come back to Ireland. Yeah. And uh, but what did he do in this time there in the in in the Roman Empire? So again, he kind of disc- we don't know much about whether he was religious before his experiences with this voice. Yeah, but we know that from that time on, he tried to return to a normal life first when he got back. But after he heard that voice, he became very religious, and he went to France for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And he's, well, again, one story is that he came down to France, North France, and got an education there, and then eventually made his way back to Ireland. And when he came back, he arrived somewhere around um, Wicklow. Okay. Again, the dates, yeah, the names of to, locations you know. are different, but somewhere around that area, and they didn't welcome him. They didn't like him. Some of the other Christians, in fact, didn't like that he was here. Um, he had a reputation for giving back gifts or giving the gifts to somebody else. So kings and chiefs in Ireland would have given him gifts because we wouldn't have had one king of Ireland ever. We had anywhere between 100 and maybe 150. So each county that we have today or even smaller smaller would would be a different kingdom. Yeah. Now you would have had bigger kingdoms as well. That would have been a few counties. But inside of that could have been a bigger king a more important king, okay. but inside of his kingdom could have been smaller kingdoms. Okay. So it's, it, you know, it depends. If a king died, maybe his land went to another king. Maybe there was a war. It was always changing. Okay. So it was a complicated thing, but you had individual chiefs and they would give to St. Patrick, but um, maybe what made him unpopular was a lot of the wives or the ladies of the kings and chiefs were giving him a lot of presents. We don't know why. <laughs> But Don't know he why. was popular with women. They were very uh, happy to give him gifts, but he would give the gifts to other people. He would give them back to mm. poor people, 
distribute them. Right. So some some of the other um, Christians maybe didn't like this. So he was under threat. He was kind of in trouble. So he had to move north. And eventually he had to move west. But how... Do do you know how he became important? Like he was becoming more important and more known between people. Yeah, he's supposed to have tr driven out snakes from Ireland. Okay, and some a lot of people say there was never snakes in Ireland. Um, you know, we'll say scientifically, yeah. and that when in the Ice Age, when Ireland and Britain were separating from the rest of Europe, that snakes travel slower basically. And by the time Ireland separated from the rest of Britain, that snakes hadn't made their way that far west. Yeah. They had only just started to come up on, you know, on the land bridge before yeah. they were separated. Um, so a lot of people think that the snake in the story is actually Druids and paganism. So the religion in Ireland before Christianity. Yeah. We think that's actually what they're talking about because they thought snakes were kind of a sacred animal. They had a kind of a special place for reptiles. No, but yeah, but I, I want to know a little bit more of before, you know, because he had one intention of bringing Christianity into Ireland, right? Yeah. So what religion did we have here? Like how, how was it, uh, how was the society here before him? Um, it was, it was, uh, this will be not the most common information, but from my research, it's the most accurate. Paganism is really complex, but you, we have holy wells. So you might be familiar with the holy wells around Ireland. In a lot of fields, we have stone circles or we have stones standing up or trees, old trees that the farmers won't touch because of these old beliefs. Okay. And so when St. Patrick came to Ireland, he didn't, he wasn't as successful at bringing Christianity as we're told today mm. because basically 200 years ago the church when the church the catholic church started to gain more power in ireland they started to remove a lot of the pagan belief mm. because a lot of poorer people kept the pagan stories for much much longer even 50 years ago there was still people doing pagan rituals in ireland Okay. And it was really about 150 years ago, there was some letters in the Vatican that were found recently or released recently, where there was bishops in Ireland writing to the Pope saying, Ireland is we're losing control of the people. They're basically having kind of like, it's almost like a Mardi Gras, you know, at the Holy... Like Val a carnival. Like or carnival. They're doing like a festival okay so we're doing the religion we're doing the christianity but there's so much of the other elements which could be drinking or partying and they didn't like that so they wanted to remove it yeah. so um about 150 years ago they really squeezed out that culture they made us ashamed of it and you were threatened with being you know excommunicated from the church um so there was a big push to kill it now that's very unpopular because to say because the church has had a it says a lot of positive as well um you know in terms of for a long time the institutions education and health were only you know when Ireland was a poorer country we needed um the church to help us with all of that yeah. so i don't i'm not i'm not trying to be too critical just more realistic about yeah. the position but also about the unity of Ireland as a country i think the the religion had a good uh, um, role in these, right, or not? Yeah, it would be kind of the poor. It was kind of, I would say, people would confuse. Well, a lot of times I think religion is used as a kind of weapon against the poor, not just in Ireland, but in every country in the world, in the past and today. We use religion to kind of divide poor people because these are made to sound complicated, but I think it's really the rich are up here mm. and they have all the money and it's very important for them that the poor aren't working together. So they will create division, religion, you know, you know, your politics, Glasses. everything. Yeah. If you're a different ethnicity, you know, they will always be these weapons to try and divide people. We see it today a lot as well. Yeah. But um, so people, people in their lives, the normal people in their normal lives, the Catholics, it doesn't seem like it mattered that much, you know, to them who you were. It, you were all the, you were all there in the community, and there was respect in the community for people. 
like people obeyed what was called the Brehan Laws, which were these laws that were some of the oldest laws, and they were kept in Ireland mm -hmm. during St. Patrick's time and afterwards. Okay, and then, okay, so, yeah, St. Patrick came here, and there was this paganism was the main religion. <laughs> well, yeah. We can't call a religion, but they they mm. were adoring gods, right? Different gods, different yeah. gods, and you the story would change in your area. So if you were in Clare, or if you were in Limerick or Cork, mm. you might have more or less the same beliefs, but they might be a little bit different because your community might never meet the other community. Mm. So you'd evolve over time your own version of the story. But are there temples today in Ireland from these paganisms, or you know, some some kind of uh, formations, rocks, like they have, yeah. we have Stonehenge, right? Uh, I think it's a pagan thing. I don't know. Yeah. 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 It's, we have like, there's Newgrange. Yeah. In, um, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. So that's a big one. Yeah. But there's other ones like one of the most un like forgotten ones is, uh, one called On the Gat. It's a cave in Roscommon and it's basically the Kings of Connacht. So the Kings of Galway, Mayo, Roscommon, Sligo, that region, they all had to go into the cave as part of the ceremony to become king because they were basically making a promise, a marriage with the land. Like, I will die for the land. Okay. It's my duty to be responsible for the people here. And that cave has, has loads of cultural belief. And even today, um, like two years ago, I went there with a woman from the Amazonas and she recognized on the edge of the cave flowers from some Amazonian religion. She said, like, they're doing a blessing on the outside of the cave. She said, this is a very specific thing in parts of South America. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. I wouldn't even notice the, the flowers. Yeah. I just thought, oh, something. I didn't even notice them. Yeah. But so there's details even today in kind of spiritual belief that we just ignore all the time. Okay. So, yeah, society here seems to be uh, very organized for a long time, like in Ireland, like yeah. this island. There were, like, there were villages and, you know, people living and working and doing all these kinds of stuff, like actually having a normal society, uh, functioning society since a long time, right? Yeah, a really long time. Yeah. It goes back... Um, well, we, again, we, it's very hard to say, but a really long time. We think the first place people arrived in Ireland was Sligo. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and like I say, St. Patrick was there. So a lot of it grew out of, because um, Ireland was so wooded when people arrived. Yeah. So it took time to kind of clear the forests. So it was on, it was beside rivers or beside the coast okay. that you would have had a lot of early civilizations. Yeah, since the v Vikings... Uh, or, or, way before the Vikings. Way before the Vikings. It, when the Vikings came, it broke. It changed a lot of Irish culture. Mm. Like even something like the Olympics. Um, where would you say the Olympics is from? From Greece. It, <laughs> so you would be right. You would yeah. be right. But there is an older um, games called the Chelton Games from County Mead, mm. and it was it had to stop when the Vikings invaded. Mm. But it was basically all the kingdoms would go together and they would meet in Mead, and they would have games. But they didn't stop with sport. They had art competitions, music competitions, storytelling, a version of chess. So it was loads of stuff. But after the Vikings were, and it was, this was happening a thousand years before the Olympics, the Greek Olympics. Oh so we think what actually happened was people from Greece came to Ireland, saw these games and brought this idea back to Greece and invented the Olympics from Ireland. Yeah, so this is very interesting, you know. You could go forever in different directions with these things, but the Irish games, they restarted them when Ireland was free of England for three years. When the Olympics were on in the 1920s and 1930s, they ran them. So sometimes I go to schools and kids who don't know anything about their family's history will come to me and say, after I've done the talk, my parents found the medal. My parents, uh, my great, great grandparents won the medal. Okay. at this time but no one remembers it even those games 100 years ago are forgotten because of because of it but the GAA mm. when that was started that was to try and save it because it was all dying it was all going to be gone forever so in order to save some of it they they picked the like the two most popular things Gaelic football and hurling yeah to preserve the to coach. preserve to preserve some of it because they, mm. they knew they couldn't save it all so they had to sacrifice some yeah so <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Like, it's a very old uh, history, you know. So, we, mm -hmm. 
it has to be like there there are some aspects that we still don't know you know yeah yeah uh, but yeah so coming back to St. Patrick's we have this belief or people say I don't know maybe it's a myth that St. Patrick would use the clover right the, the, the yes how do you say it yeah the the clover so you see on uh, my jumper here it's yeah. the triskelly so it's a the, symbol that's it was similar to what um St. Patrick used with the four with the tree leaf clover yeah um, it was for the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, or Pai Filio Spiritus Santo. Yeah. And the Trinity. Right? The Trinity. We already had a version of it in Ireland. Mm. So four and a half thousand years ago, you were at Newgrange. Yeah. So this symbol is on those old stones at the entrance. And it's the first example of it in County Mead. Yeah. Uh, we think in the world. And so this was for the body, mind and spirit. Okay. So some communities, when St. Patrick was coming around, actually rejected his ideas because they said, thanks, but no thanks. We already have our beliefs. And there was a movie made um, by an Irish company called Cartoon Saloon. Um, they made a movie called Wolf Walkers mm. and it got a load of awards internationally. It's, a, it's basically taking this idea that people had from thousands of years ago some people believe that when you went to sleep in Ireland, you became a wolf. You created another body, a wolf body that you could, your spirit could travel Ireland in. Okay. So particularly around Offaly and Kilkenny, they had this belief. And it was these tribal kind of groups of people who lived more in the forest and more away from bigger communities that had this belief. So when they met St. Patrick, they were supposed to have said, no, we we're not interested because they were so committed to this belief they had yeah so his life was about this right so travel around uh, places in the country yes and then keeping showing the faith or you know uh, trying to uh, how, how do you say this in, in english um yeah so trying to educate people in the faith catholic faith yeah and he did a lot of good as well uh he founded 300 churches Sorry, I said Catholic, but uh, Christian, it yeah, would Christian. be the same thing. Yeah? Catholic kind of, yeah, it became more distinct later. Okay, yeah. okay. But yeah, so he, he, you said he founded churches. 300 churches in Ireland 300. are supposed to have been founded by him. Okay. Yeah. But so he, around the country, all everywhere. All over the country. He was busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you go into the mythology then, um, there's some more interesting stuff with him. Uh, like the folklore, like um, we know Croke Patrick is maybe the most famous location for him. So I don't know if you've climbed Croke Patrick I, yourself. I, I haven't been there yet, but no. Uh, um, uh, what is this? It's a mountain? A mountain in Mayo, so near Westport. And it's people will be going there this week. It'll be very busy on the 1st of August. It's extremely busy, um, kind of around Easter as well, because St. Patrick was supposed to have climbed it. Okay. And the oldest story is that when he was climbing it, he, he fasted for 40 days, mm -hmm. so he didn't eat. And um, he was being tempted to break with God by a load of demons. So they were they were in the shape of black birds mm -hmm. and they were tempting him and talking to him. And eventually they got frustrated and they created a huge cloud that blocked out the sun and created darkness in Ireland. And there's this legendary bell that St. Patrick had. It was supposed to have some sort of magical or, or miraculous power. Mm -hmm. So when he hit the bell really hard, it basically broke the birds and cast them back to where they'd come from. And there's another Irish story, a very famous one children know, the children of Lear. And he uses the bell in this story. It's a story about four children. Their father is the king. Their mom dies and he loves the kids so much. He has to get married. So he gets married to his dead wife's sister yeah, to kind of keep the kingdom, I guess, together. And she's very jealous of how much he loves the children. So she uses magic when the children are in the lake swimming to turn them into swans. So for 300 years, they are swans at the lake and the father visits them. But then they are forced out into like the you know, the storms in the ocean between Ireland and Scotland. Yeah. And they're stuck there for 300 years. And when they come back, their father's gone. And they've been hunted by kings to be pets for 300 years. And at the end, they land on, a, on an island called Inishglora 
uh, off the coast of Mayo and the armies are coming to catch the children and they're in big trouble and then St. Patrick is on the island and he picks up the bell and he rings the bell and it breaks the spell and they become people again. Oh, okay. So it's come up a few times, this story of him with the bell breaking and both of these stories happen in Mayo. So Mayo has a special connection to him. What other places have a special connection to St. Patrick's? I know that uh, he, I think he died in what would be Northern Ireland, is it? No. Yes. Yeah. Um, they actually, it's, there was actually a war between kingdoms after he died mm. because two kingdoms wanted his body. Oh, really? They wanted to have his body and his possessions. There mm. was a lot of ideas that there was magic in what he owned. Mm. So there was, a, there was actually a war and they eventually agreed where he'd be buried. But there's a couple of different ideas of where he was buried. But yeah, in Northern Ireland. Yeah, because yeah, at this time we are saying Northern Ireland, but at this time it was one island. Of course, it's still one island, but uh, it was one country, right? Ireland. One country, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, when we say he traveled around the country, it's the whole island of Ireland. Right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, but what 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 else did he? Uh, what else did he do here? Like, I'm just trying not to forget anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, he had a busy life. Um, there was stories that he knew St. Bridget, that she met him. Um, there's a well, there's a holy well just outside of um, a town in Limerick, Newcastle West, mm. uh, not far from Adair Manor. Um, it's, it's um, this holy well has a story about him being kind of coming down to visit her and there was an argument between them because she fell asleep during one of his sermons yeah. he would be talking and she fell asleep so <laughs> they didn't there was some stories that they didn't get on very well yeah yeah and now both both sent yeah both famously yeah. yeah well 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 um liked in ireland um one other thing i suppose about croke patrick that's interesting is a lot of these places that are known for saint patrick they had an older history So Croke Patrick, it used to be called the Reek. Mm. And it was a place where people celebrated a different guy called Crom Crua. And he was known as one of our, the God of Death God of in death. Irish mythology. Yeah. Uh, about the name Patrick. We know that today is very common to, you know, like a lot of people are called Patrick here. Yeah. Uh, do we have an idea of his real name? Because I know it's not Patrick, right? No, uh, <laughs> there's a couple of ideas. Can I show you? Yeah, Grab yeah. Here? No so worries. I do my notes on kind of every place I can find the information. Mm -hmm. He gave different, well, if we're to believe what he wrote was what he wrote. He gave himself different names, different times. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, this thing called the Confessio, which is one of the books we think he wrote, kind of an account of his life and letter to the soldiers of um, Caroticus or Ep Epistola. Um, so one name we have for him is Patricius, that he called himself. Okay. But then there's other people we think were in Ireland, like there's this guy called Palladius. Um, his last, I, I have it here, his last surviving disciple was this guy called Mokta. Mm -hmm. So it, like we had many more saints who were trained up by St. Patrick and they would have traveled around all of Ireland mm -hmm. and spread the word even more. Yeah. So... You know, sometimes, like like I say, he, he gave himself that name, Patric Patricicus, I think it is. Mm. Um, but he had a long life and some of the texts that we think, you know, some of his disciples wrote or people later, you know, 100 years later, 200 years later, were writing down from older, you know, diary entries or recorded information from during his life people who met him yeah. wrote about him the name changes a little bit which makes it confusing yeah. because we think there was three more saints with a similar name in ireland so who was patrick who was a different guy yeah. maybe it was three or four guys who were spreading around ireland and that's why there is patrick everywhere yeah if you think about it without instant communication without uh, internet there could be three, four uh, different people who were, you know, by the name of Patrick or something similar, and yeah. they could be mixed into one and, you know, and create this um, myth, but not, not in the bad sense of the word. Like, you know, it could be this super guy who, you know, did all these things, but in theory, 
could be more than one. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's kind of the great thing about I suppose cult, cultural stuff like this is there's so much we don't know. Yeah. Like there's parts we know, and then there's loads of gray or missing parts. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great way for people to be creative, and people can put their own understanding on that. So it can be a very individual thing, what it means to us individually. Some people can completely believe believe um, it was one person. Other people might disagree. Uh, but it's it's completely up to the individual and what parts of the story connect with us yeah. and mean something to us. And that's really what we should take out of it. Okay, so St. Patrick, after his death, and then we have this gap of 200 years, and then... Uh, he became more and more important, like historic. How how did this happen? Um, it kind of came from a thing called, it, it becomes a little bit legal. Yeah. So it was, Catholics were illegal in Ireland for a long time. Okay. Um, but the church, before, before England took a bigger role, and especially it was when Henry VIII split with the with the with Rome when he created the Protestant church before that it was all, all of it was Christian okay but like I said the saints in Ireland including Patrick mainly concentrated on getting rich people the kings the chiefs the people with money and power to convert so all of their all of their servants or the people under them in the in the community they might say oh we surrender yeah. Um, or we we um, we agree we abandon paganism, but they actually in practice they were keeping the pagan beliefs. Mm -hmm. The the idea probably would be let me convert this king and then the religion will spread. Yeah, yeah. but in o officially it did, but in practice they had to constantly take on the ideas mm -hmm. of the local people. So the local holy well, if you go to a holy well for St. Patrick or for St. Bridget or St. Colum or any of the other saints, they, um, they're they not just for those saints. Those holy wells were important locations long before those saints came to Ireland. Okay. Can you explain what a holy well is? Just uh, so yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, sure. <laughs> so we have in Ireland, in, just in County Clare, I think we have 350 holy wells. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of them in the country. Yeah. Um, which is maybe 2,000 or more in the country. Uh, so Holy Well would be like kind of a religious place in your local community, a little well for water, and people would go to it, and it, each well would have a saint dedicated to it. Okay. And, one, you know, on one day of the year, so of course St. Patrick's Day is the 17th of March, and it's the day we think he died. That's why it's that day. Um, St. Bridget's is the first... Um, St. Patrick had a sister, St. Derica, and her saint day is later in March. It might be the 25th of March. I can't mm. remember exactly right now, but she has a date soon after St. Patrick's. So there's a whole load of different dates for different saints. Okay. And you would go to there. So if you had an eye infection, this is quite horrible. Now, <laughs> yeah. But when you had an eye infection, you would be told, go to this water on this day, the holy day, and wash your eyes. So everyone with an eye infection was washing in the same water. Then it will so, be clean. <laughs> no. <laughs> we'd all be good afterwards, yeah. yeah. So I don't know if this stuff was working. I have my doubts. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. one would be for this, one would be for headaches or throat. It was all different, different ideas for different times in the year. Yeah, so... We were in the holy wells, and then they interrupted you. Um, so the holy wells they began they began much before the saints, okay. because and the way we know this is because some of the saints we know they were never Christian. Mm. They were important people in the community, and the church took them as saints. They changed them into saints hundreds of years later mm -hmm. to kind of convert people. Yeah, because that person stayed important to that area. Yeah, if you believe in this guy, so they would. It's the church would change. take him and say, look, this guy is a saint, he's, you know, holy, and then uh, the person will start believing in the faith, right? Totally. That's it. Yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah, after that, how did the St. Patrick's Day especially become this whole Irish thing, became this uh, synonymous of Ireland? Um. I think it was just kind of wanting to 
celebrate Ireland, but Ireland was very much controlled by the church. Mm. Like, it be- would say in 1829, there was a thing called the Catholic Emancipation Act. Mm. So before that, it, it was illegal to be a priest. You'd be arrested if you were a priest in Ireland. What so, was the religion that people were supposed to be here? It was Protestantism. Protestant. So because of the control of uh, England. England. Yeah. Basically, they made it illegal to be uh, for for priests. They couldn't arrest every Catholic because you didn't have enough space in prisons. <laughs> so instead what they did was they made it illegal for pri- pri- priests to come to Ireland. So they thought in a couple of generations they'd die out. So Ireland used to have to get their priests from other parts of Europe as well. Would and be a risky profession, right? So yeah. to come here and to be a priest. <laughs> Big person has to be very uh, courageous. and very Courageous, strong. dedicated. It wasn't an easy job. Yeah. And you would be going around. They, ha- they couldn't have a church. So they had mass rocks. Okay. So again, sites that were significant in the past, they would go to them and that's where people would go and have mass. So all over Ireland today, you in Dublin as well, there'll be signs on the you know, to little fields with a stone in it and it'll be called a mass rock. So that's what they're talking about is when they couldn't have mass in public, they had to do it in secret. They would go to these church, to these fields and just are in a wood and they would just have the mass. They would pray there. Yeah, the, the the priest would be there and he would give the ceremony, he would give you communion, and then you but you had to be careful that it wasn't the police didn't know about it. Yeah. Oh my god. So it was a different time and mm. but once the Catholic Emancipation Act came into effect, it basically gave the priests a bit more power. Mm. They weren't persecuted the way they were before. And as time went on, there's two things it's Two things I think are really important and they're important for today as well. They're about mental health. Mm. Ireland has had a huge historical problem with suicide and depression and talking about trauma, having, you know, having something difficult in your life and talking about it. As a culture, we've for a long time not been able to communicate or not felt comfortable communicating Mm. our personal problems, psychological problems. And part of that, I think it was two things. One, it was some of the decisions with the church in terms of closing all of these older beliefs and traditions. And it was, you were shamed if you were, if you weren't doing what you were told to do, if you were different, there was a shame, there was a lot of pressure. But also we had a new phenomenon. We had asylums. So I don't know how to best explain it. Mental, like hospitals for the mentally unwell. And so we built an awful lot of asylums in Ireland from the 18, they started in the 1830s up until about the 1870s. We built a lot of them and they were huge buildings and there was a lot of problems with them. The the intention was very good. The intention was great. Was to treat the people. People who had illness, mental illness, but there was an awful lot of problems with it. And, um, the idea was it was rich people who set up this. The people on the committee were all rich lords with big houses. You know, the likes of Malahide Castle, Slane Castle, big lords. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying those lords specifically, but just mm-hmm. that idea of a lot of money. They thought that it would cure your mind if you lived in a huge estate. Like if you had a beautiful garden in a big estate, loads of space. They thought this would cure people who have mental conditions. Yeah. They didn't really understand um, mental health the way we do today. Yeah. And unfortunately, the person in charge was also the person in charge of prisons. So after a while, when they were looking at prisons being full and the hospitals being half empty, they said, we're we going to make our space. prisons easier. Yeah. yeah. So they took out the worst prisoners, not ones who were mentally ill, but the most difficult. So prisoners that might have very disgusting habits or might do horrible things, really like unhealthy things. Mm -hmm. And they were putting them into these hospitals with people who were mentally ill. And the other thing they did was they made a law called the Lunatics Act. Mm -hmm. And it meant that if if I had a twitchy eye, if you and I were brothers and I had a twitchy eye and you wanted to emigrate to America and you thought, hmm, Tommy might not get in because his eye is twitching or he has some sort of thing that people might think is weird. So to make it easier, you could say, 
my bro, you know, my brother is crazy. Oh. And I would be checked by a doctor. And the doctor, if he checked me and found I was crazy, I'd have to go to hospital till I recovered. Mm. But if I if he said I'm not crazy, they still put me in for six months, no matter what. My good. Yeah. So it didn't matter. Once someone accused you, it didn't matter if you were crazy or not. You had to go for six months. And what happened was if if someone was a poor family and they're trying to start a life in another country, they would sell all of the possessions in the six months. So when you came out, there was nowhere to go. So you had to go back to the hospital. And then you would live your whole life there a lot of because people, of a twitchy eye. A lot of people live their whole lives yeah. in hospitals who never had a mental health problem. They might have just looked different or sounded different. You know, they might have been born with a lisp or a, a cleft palate. So, um, you know, and, and there was a kind of a wall of silence around this. So we had this going on. We had the church saying, do what we say and you can't be different. Now, individual priests can do great things in communities and that's not true of every community. But on a, on a national level, around the country in general, there was a kind of a wall of mm. do what the church says. The church has kind of the spiritual power. You'll go to hell if you don't do what we say. Mm. And at the same time, um, you had kind of this wall of silence around mental health. So I think kind of... People were looking for positives and one of the things the church wanted to bring up was saints mm. and St. Patrick was a well-known saint, but also we had a kind of, we had this expectation that women should be at home, women should work at home, they shouldn't be out of the house. So I think St. Patrick was lifted over St. Bridget because he was a man. Okay. And in Ireland, historically, women were very, compared to many other countries going back hundreds of years and thousands of years, women in Ireland were far more important to our society functioning. Okay. And it's only a quite a modern thing that we've, 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 we, we broke that for a time. Hmm. But uh, I think that was part of the reason St. Patrick became so important. Sorry, I know it's very, no, no, it's, it's a lot okay. of things. Yeah, but no, it's good, <laughs> it's good. And then after that, uh, yeah, one thing is St. Patrick becoming important in Ireland. How did this spread to the to to the world? Um, I mean the the whole the whole celebration of St Patrick's Day and the whole uh, connection between what you know it's analog. You think about Ireland, you think about the green, and you think about St Patrick's. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, how how did this whole thing become so wild, uh, wide, worldwide known? Um, it's funny, St. Patrick wasn't always associated with green and Ireland wasn't always associated with green. It was blue for a very long time and it was changed. I can't remember exactly when it was changed, but there was a decision to change it. But it was mu for St. Patrick was associated with blue way more in history than green. Mm. It's just in our lifetime and in the last couple hundred years, it's been it's been green. Yeah. Um, But the um, do, you, do you have any idea why this changed? I've read about it before, but I'll be honest, I can't remember right this moment. Maybe um, it's just a fashion uh, <laughs> thing. There, there was something more to it. There was there was a story behind it. I know I've I've I know other people have talked about it before. Um, but you know, Irish culture it's so vast. So mm -hmm. if I'm not an expert in an area, I will kind of be honest and say, I don't know everything about this topic, so no, I can't okay. It's okay, speak no on it. But um, yeah, I suppose with how it's spread around the world, it's St. Patrick isn't the only thing to spread around the world. It's just, I suppose, the most famous one. Mm. Uh, I suppose everyone knows what a leprechaun is. Yeah. Um, but we have a whole host of things that people don't realize came from Ireland. We I mentioned the Olympics earlier. Um, but also things like Dracula, uh, big parts of the stories of Narnia, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones. Big parts of those stories were taken directly from Irish stories. King Arthur in England, the medieval stories of King Arthur and Merlin. Because when Rome invade, conquered mm. uh, Britain, or most of Britain, most of the culture in Britain was gone. Their old culture was gone. So they borrowed from Irish myths and legends to rebuild their culture. No. So our culture is constantly reinvented other other places around the world. Um, 
But St. Patrick, like I say, is the most famous one, probably because of all the Irish going over to America. Because of the, f the famine, right? Yeah, we had a great famine. And the biggest, the biggest lie, I would say, uh, about the famine, and it was one I was told when I was in school, it's not the teacher's fault, it's just, it's a lie that everybody knows. Everyone is told it, it becomes the truth. Um, they say a million people died in the famine. It was probably more like three or four million. Um, the reason we believe that is because potatoes were pretty new to Ireland. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the population of Ireland before potato and after potato, it was exploding mm. because potato is a deep plant. Mm. So you don't need a lot of space to grow potato. Yeah. And there's loads of calories in potato. Mm. So poor communities, poor families who had tiny plots of land before couldn't have big families. Yeah. But after the potato, they were having big families, 14 kids, 15 kids. That was normal. So you had huge populations. So if all of those kids have 15 more kids and 15 more kids, you can imagine the population was just yeah. exploded. So it was um, the population, they say when the famine hit was 8 million, but that's wrong. They're using older information from years earlier. So the there's a down in Cork in the university, there was a paper made about 20, 25 years ago that explored all of this. And it looks like the population was probably closer to 11 million, 10, 11 million. And today we complain about the lack of housing for five years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But imagine, you know, at this time. But I, I for the lifestyle of, of those times, like people would live in bigger houses and a lot of people inside these houses, right? Well, sometimes you'd have had, um, you might have had a house with two bedrooms and you might have had seven or eight children living in the one room. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people lived in very poor, poor housing. And also in the countryside, not, mm -hmm. not, not only in Dublin or, you know, in the yeah. bigger cities. Dublin was much smaller. The cities were much, much smaller, but the villages were much bigger. Okay. And there's a lot of villages that existed in mountains that are, they're gone. There's nothing left of them oh. because everyone died or moved. But yeah, so because of the famine, uh, a lot of people moved to the U.S. and mm -hmm. uh, other countries as well. And then they kept spreading the, the Irish culture, right? We think that's what happened. So, and it's strong in America today, like Barack Obama came to Ireland. Every president of America, I think is, again, this is only my opinion, but I think they have to come to Ireland because no president of Ireland, or America, I should say, since um, John F. Kennedy, has not visited Ireland. Clinton visited, Nixon visited, uh, Johnson visited, um, I think Ford visited, uh, the Bushes, uh, all of them have had to visit because there's about 40 million Irish Americans in America. It's the biggest voting population that's kind of centralized. I Again, I'm. this is my opinion, that it's a more, it's a more connected group that will feel a connection to, oh, we're talking about something from where, we, where we're where we coming from. Because there isn't a culture, the Native American culture was wiped from America. Yeah. So a lot of Americans come to Ireland because they're fascinated, especially when they get older, when you're 40, 50, 60, 70, you want to feel like you belong to something more than your own life. Materialism starts to fall away mm. and you start to look at God, that was a culture and that's where our ancestors were from. So that's why Ireland has about 11 million visitors every year yeah. compared to other countries. Like even we'll look at Brazil. I think it's 40 million per year or 50 million per year. No, Brazil. It's in Maybe it's less. It's but then the population is 210, yeah. 220 million. Whereas yeah. in Ireland, we have double our population. Yeah. So if Brazil had the same tourists we have, you would need to be having half a billion tourists coming per year. Yeah. Yeah, so it would be a different. It's a, it's a lot. Uh, it's, it's huge. A, difference. Proportionally, it's crazy. Like yeah, the, the amount of tourists here, and uh, yeah, the Americans they fly straight from there, and there is like they they go to Shannon or here, you know, yeah. like straight and go play golf. <laughs> a lot of golf. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they just want to connect with that past because they don't have it, and um, you know, a lot of countries don't. Ireland is kind of. Against it's not it's not this, the normal, 
because other countries, especially even World War One and Two, more culture gets destroyed in Europe. But Ireland isn't in those wars really, so it survives a lot of, you know, international conflict because it's on the edge of the world and it's always it's been inhabited for thousands of years. So that's why the culture preserved so well. And tell me, uh, people now they 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 think St. Patrick's Day is all about the drinking. Does yeah. does this bother an Irish person or not? Uh, no, most don't mind. No. And look, when I was in college, it didn't bother me. <laughs> um, no, we, we all we all I suppose celebrated different ways. Um, I'd be very excited to see people be more interested in the more 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 bring it back to life the older parts of it because there's a lot the, of the, the story the the history of the, the thing. history and yeah and because there's so many gaps i think a lot of people today if you're an artist if you're making movies if you're doing podcasts you can do an awful lot creatively with the past mm -hmm. but we're not passionate about it because we're taught Oh, it's boring, it's embarrassing to be interested in this stuff. But comic books were embarrassing for people 30 years ago. And then every year Marvel make a movie, a billion dollars, a billion dollars, a billion dollars. Yeah. There's money, like even stuff like Dracula. I mentioned he comes from Ireland. Dracula is the most um, common character to appear in film hmm. in the world. In anything. Most? Most. Dracula appears in more movies, books, everything than any other character. It doesn't have, well, with the name Dracula and everything. like uh, Yeah, like a version of a him. Version, like it yeah. can be Hotel Transylvania. It yeah. can be something like Bram Stoker's Dracula. Hmm. It can be any form. But the, the idea, or this idea that was created in Ireland and taken from older Irish stories, it's, it's we allowed it to be taken to Romania and... I'm really sorry, Romania and Transylvania, but it has basically nothing to do with them. It's entirely an Irish story. Well, that, but that's fascinating, man. What I think, very, what I really like about the story, let's say we were talking about St. Patrick's here. Yeah. And then, as you're saying, you know, his path, I'm imagining the society at this time, you know, like imagining what the villages that he's been through, you know, what he's eating and what he's doing and, you know, how the, the whole thing is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best part of, of history, you know, like because you, you want to be transported there, yeah. you know, because to the, we are part of what these people did back then, you know. Yeah, and like you said there, you're following a story. It's very hard to talk about a million people or a civilization, but it's very easy to tell a story about one person. Yeah. And so you can follow the journey of St. Patrick because there's more information or there's more stories about him than most other saints in Ireland. There were loads of other saints that are kind of, there wasn't as much story about them. Yeah. But his story, and because he went to all parts of Ireland, you can kind of follow that story and connect with it. So if you lived in Derry, if you lived in Mayo or Waterford, you still had a St. Patrick's story. Whereas other saints might have only been to one region. You would yeah. have had specific to geographic area. So when people, again, when they went to America or Australia or England, they brought that story of, um, of St. Patrick kind of, it was very much, how would you say, he didn't, he, it was one person's story, but it, everyone knew it. Yeah. They knew their version of it. So it was easy to kind of tell it to more people. And another thing probably that helps sell Ireland as a culture and St. Patrick's Day is we haven't invaded other countries. We don't have like a difficult history with other cultures. Yeah, no, everybody loves Ireland. So it makes it easier, I think, to yeah. sell. Yeah, there isn't a, dar there isn't like... It hasn't offended other cultures. Yeah. If anything, you were the victim. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, at yeah. some point, you know, like... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're We're usually, again, it would be kind of... We're the victim of rich. Like, mm. it can be very... It might not be helpful because some people, even in my lifetime, some people would still have opinions about people from England. Mm. that I think aren't very helpful. They're, yeah. they're like, oh, they controlled us for 800 years. It's, I think it's a lot of negative energy. I think it's much more like the super, super rich 
alienating the poor and creating a situation. So the rich were Irish as well. You know, there was the local kings who were Irish who did that as well. So we know officially Ireland was owned by the English, but it was the uh, it was the lords in charge who made these decisions. Okay. It wasn't like poor English people or ordinary English people or ordinary Irish people. No, constructively, we should just look forward, you know, in yeah. this uh, relation, you know, that now it's... Uh, Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, Bevor, uh, so we can wrap up. How, uh, like, what, did we forget anything? What, is there any myth you would like to clarify here about St. Patrick's? Um, St. Patrick. <laughs> Sorry, I'm saying St. Patrick's because St. Patrick's Day, but it's St. Patrick. Uh, and, yeah, tell first about that and then we, we can talk about something else as well. Yeah, um... St. Patrick, I suppose he had two sisters and they get forgotten about in Nobody Irish. talks about them. No one. <laughs> no one talks about them. Uh. Um, his older sister was St. Derica and she would be very, very popular because uh, she was supposed to have, uh, there was a, she blessed a barrel of beer mm -hmm. for one of the chieftains well, and it never ran important. out. <laughs> <laughs> so it never ran out. So you could drink forever with it. So. Oh. She she should be up there, especially with all the drinking on St. Patrick's Day. We should be remembering her and yeah. raising a glass for her. Uh, it's St. Derica and? Um, St. I'm going to have to refer sorry. to yeah, my notes yeah. here because I, I don't get to talk about them too often. Um, let me find her here. I have a lot of notes, as you can see. <laughs> she was of the last dragon of Ireland. Yeah. I have her here. It's okay. No no pressure. Eh? I put you on the spot there. Yeah, there was Derica <laughs> and then there was... Must be Erica. Liaman. <laughs> Liaman. Liaman, I think. So it was around Loch Carob in Galway that she was known. And there's a stone, I'm going to read my notes again for this. It's called the Lugnadian Pillar. And it's basically a cross. There's a cross on it and it's pointed north. And this, there's an inscription on it that means the stone of Lugnadian, son of Limanu. Uh, but we think that might have been a different name for hmm. Liamain. And we don't know much about her. She she was again credited with kind of uh, blessing. How would you say? She was credited with blessing a barrel of beer too in Galway. Okay. So she also gave the local chieftains lots to drink. Yeah. And she's the patron saint of Valencia Island in Kerry. So um, they were important, more important in the past. Um, St. Jerrica also, she was supposed to have had a load of husbands. So maybe they didn't want to talk about her because... Yeah. She had a lot of husbands. So, the um, church wouldn't like it. No, maybe not. <laughs> and she, one of her children was supposed to have gone on to be one of the kings of England in medieval times. All right. So, yeah, um, yeah there's, there's just, you could go forever yeah. in different directions with the stories. Oh, but that's very interesting. You know, I really like to know more about uh, St. Patrick and this whole Irish history that you, that you, that you have here. And... Uh, how do you know everything about that? And uh, tell a little bit more about your, your work. Yeah, so um, I suppose I'm doing it for seven years, six or seven years, um, full time since COVID. Mm. Um, I wanted to write books about Irish folklore. And I thought I was looking at things like Game of Thrones and I thought, oh, Ireland has so many stories and I could create a world like that of Irish mythology, but with the benefit that you can actually visit the sites. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping it would help tourism because in Ireland, if you go to Clare, you go to the Cliffs of Moher. If you go to Dublin, you go to Dublin Castle. It's very oversimplified. Mm -hmm. And I think we lose a lot of the beauty of our culture with that. And I think people don't get the experience they want. They don't get something special and unique. So I decided to start recording lesser known locations and we're lucky because the locations if you find the castle or find a stone or find the field there'll be a whole host of information about it mm. people in the area so i will always talk about a subject when i've gone to the location mm. 
I have to see it and walk around and talk to people. And then on top of that, we have an awful lot of old manuscripts that were written a thousand years ago by the monks. And these these are very detailed and they give us more information as well. So yeah. it's from loads of sources. I never stop finding more sources to look at. And a hundred years ago, there was a group of collectors mm. who came around all of Ireland and they went to every school and they interviewed all the children in Ireland and they had them write down, they wrote down the stories that the children had in the schools. And by doing this, they preserved a whole generation of folklore because after the radio was invented and after TVs, no one really cared to hear these stories. Yeah. But before, before all of that, the way people entertained each other and kept alive these ideas of St. Patrick, they would sit in the community on certain nights in a house. They would make, they would have a fire and everyone would just talk and sing and dance and share knowledge. That was the television of the time. How they communicate. Yeah. yeah. And then you, you got interested in all this. I love it because it's yeah. dying. If we don't talk about it, if we don't record it or update it for the modern audience, mm -hmm. it will be gone. And we won't bring it back. And we've seen it like I, my partner is Brazilian yeah. and I've been fascinated with Brazilian uh, folklore. I think it's incredible. And I think it's just a, such a shame that it's focused all on children. Yeah. I think there could be so much more pride in the focus on it. And particularly like, um, you know, even Omo do Sacco. Mm. Am I allowed to yeah. move off topic o a little bit? Omo do Sacco. Omo do Sacco. Omo do Sacco. So I was amazed by this story. It's based on a true crime that happened in Spain. But um, what I lo what I was really drawn to was, and I, I made a short film. I haven't edited it yet, but I was up in Suricaba in Brazil last two years ago. I have to put the film together, but I wanted to do a version of Om. Not that he's, oh, he's very simple. You know, your parents show you Om, 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 Om do Sacco saying like, he's going to get you if you don't stop to do what I tell you, you know, yeah. if you're not listening to your parents. That was what I understood everyone told me. I thought, what about a story about a guy who is from a good community, lives in a condominium. Hmm. He's disrespected. He feels disrespected in the modern world. He did what he was supposed to, went to college, did the things, did the things. He's had some mental health problems and he really feels like he doesn't belong in society. So he's very angry, not with one person, but with society. And he wants to hurt society. He thinks, how am I going to hurt society? I will take away the children. Mm -hmm. So he starts to take the children and it's, he's taking children from the favelas, from the poor communities. So nobody cares. The police aren't caring. The mothers of the children are crying. No one's listening. The police aren't, the journalists aren't, no one. And then um, in his condominium, he has an item, a toy from one of the children. And it's reported in one of the radio stations and a child in this condominium recognizes him. And he sees the child knows who, who knows who he is. And before the child tells his mom, like he's, the child is shy, the child doesn't tell his mom, he's just freaked out. Mm -hmm. And that night he breaks in and kidnaps the child. Yeah. So we made a film about it because I wanted to kind of make some idea about Omum de Sacco that mm -hmm. now that he's kidnapped a rich child, now everyone cares. Now the journalist cares. Now the police care to kind of show the difference, the gap between rich and poor in society. So I think these stories can speak to us and our values in the world today. Yeah. By, you know, bringing them to life and bringing them into our modern day. Modernizing them as well. Big time. And they're more interesting, I think, when we give them more flavor. Yeah. You know, like in Ireland, if you look at folklore, it's the leprechaun. Yeah. And I, again, that's, you know. Simplified. Oversimplified, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, the leprechaun, there used to be one guy dressed up as the leprechaun in near Trinity College in Dublin. Oh, really? But yeah. he's not there anymore. But yeah, uh, so how can people find more about your work and, you know, like talk to you and send you a message? Um, so Balor Otherworld is my channel, Balor, B-A-L-O-R. Even just that will find me. Um, mm. So on Instagram, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. I have a website, but it's it's down at the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've loads more. I have very little put up. I've mountains of work recorded that we're just need editors to help us get it up and re up and released. 
yeah uh, the, the links will be here on the description of this uh, video so if, if anyone's interested in learning more about the Irish folklore and no, yeah. not only Irish right folklore in general yeah uh, mainly Irish but yeah I look at other cultures yeah. you know Scotland Brazil yeah and talk to Baylor and also before we before we finish explain a little bit more about the the clothes that we are wearing because they are very cool and i didn't talk about them in the beginning um yeah so the clothes um it's a woman down in county clare who is near me who uh, makes them so it's old style kind of celtic clothes so yeah. this is before st patrick's um or around uh, the it's kind of its own style it yeah. just looks cool it, it's to look kind of celtic it's very hard to get celtic clothes yeah. anywhere um there's no one doing good quality so yeah. she does great quality it's very comfortable and yeah. i believe it's kind of warm right it's like, pretty warm yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice very good and she does the patterns like um so she she's an artist from mm. from um from Ireland and she makes beautiful clothes so she's getting very famous for it now and she like I say if you want kind of a, that pattern the old style patterns yeah. that you know belongs to all the old old um, culture of Ireland yeah yeah uh, let's put her name here in the description as well yeah yeah perfect yeah okay so Baylor, thank you so much for for being here in Boulder podcast thank you and, for having me yeah and Guys, hit the like button and subscribe to this channel if you'd like to learn more about Irish culture as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> okay, uh, goodbye to this camera. Put in the main camera there, Bruno. Uh, yeah, say goodbye. Uh, ciao. See you. Ciao. <laughs>